Are you guys witnessing how the Palestinians react in the face of adversity? Their steadfastness is exemplary because they hold on to the holy book of Quran. It's a magical book, I tell you. Sounds too far-fetched? Let me demonstrate by just taking one verse from the Quran and we'll examine from the scientific content and technical point of view. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Rabbi Shrohli Sudri Wa Yassirli Amri Wa Hlul Aqadatan Min Lisani Al-Qawli Welcome back to my channel, I'm Sri. To Muslims, the Quran is not just a book, it's the word from the God Himself, Allah. The powerful words of all is verse 255 from the second surah, Al-Baqarah, called Ayatul Kursi, the words of the throne, which speaks of Allah's sovereignty and might. 70,000 angels accompanied the chief of angels, Jibril alayhi salam, when the verse was revealed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu First, we'll examine the verse from a structural point of view. Contrary to traditional scholars who viewed the Quran as a jumbled up book which jumps from topic to topic quite abruptly, However, modern scholars have found an incomparable, flabbergasting ring structure. Now, what is a ring structure? Let's check out this video which would explain ring structure way better than I would. In fact, modern research has discovered a remarkable structure in the Quran known as ring composition. To demonstrate this, let's analyze the second chapter of the Quran known as Al-Baqarah, the cow. This chapter consists of a total of 286 verses. The entire chapter can be divided into nine groups based on theme. The first group of verses talk about faith and unbelief. This mirrors the theme of the last group of verses. The second group covers God's creation and knowledge. This again mirrors the second to the last group's theme. The third group discusses the law given to the Israelites, which mirrors the giving of law to the Muslims in the seventh group. The fourth group relates to the test of Abraham, a mirror of the test of Muslims in the sixth group. The middle group, the fifth group, is the central theme of the entire chapter, the change in direction of the Muslim prayer. We have made you believers a middle nation, so that you may bear witness to the truth before others. We only made the direction the one you used to face in order to distinguish those who follow the messenger from those who turn on their heels. This turning point was the change in direction of the daily prayers from Jerusalem to Mecca, which represented a big test for the believers. We find the mention of this important turning point in exactly the middle of the chapter, the 143rd verse. Moreover, this verse even contains the word middle. Together these nine groups form a giant ring composition. As you can see, ring composition is structured as a sort of circle, with the central meaning placed at the center. You can think of it in terms of a mirror. So ring composition is the equivalent of putting a mirror in the middle. What is mentioned in the first half will be reflected in the second half. Things can be taken a step further. If we examine these nine groups, we find that they each contain sub-ring compositions. So what we have is rings within rings. For example, here is the eighth group with the theme of God's creation and knowledge. We can see that the beginning and the end both have the themes of giving and charity, and the central theme of God's power and knowledge is placed in the middle. Things can be taken further still. This sub-ring contains yet another ring within itself. This is the 255th verse known as Ayat al-Kursi, the verse of the throne. Just like the chapter which contains it, the verse of the throne can be divided into nine groups based on theme. The first and ninth parts each mention God's personal names. The second and eighth parts both state that God never tires. The third and seventh parts describe that God owns everything in the heavens and the earth. The fourth and sixth parts make it clear that God has total control over us and we are dependent on Him. Notice that the middle of this verse mentions before and after which could be yet another allusion to the mirroring of ring composition. 
It's worth highlighting that not only does the verse of the throne contain its own ring composition, but it is also positioned as a subring within two larger rings, a concentric ring composition. And the verses came down in conjunction with the events that unfolded around the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Watch the video till the end. You'll understand what I mean. Link in the comment section below. To get into depth into the structural aspect, I highly recommend reading this book, Divine Speech by Numan Ali Khan and Sharif Randawa, which examines the Quran from a technical point of view. Not getting so much into the content yet. Now let's examine the second aspect from a scientific point of view. But first, let's understand Einstein's theory of relativity. While receding away from the Zeitglocke clock tower, Einstein imagined what would happen if the tram car were receding at the speed of light. He realized that if he were to travel at 186,000 miles per second, the clock's hands would appear to completely freeze. At the same time, Einstein knew that back at the clock tower, the hands would tick along at their normal pace. For Einstein, Time had slowed down. This thought blew his mind. Einstein concluded that the faster you move through space, the slower you move through time. Einstein suggested that massive objects like the sun didn't pull bodies like Earth with a mysterious, inexplicable tug, but rather curved the fabric of space-time around them, forcing Earth to fall down into this steep valley. A highly simplified analogy of is the dip in a trampoline made by the of a bowling ball. If a marble were placed on that trampoline, the marble would immediately roll towards the bowling ball in the center. This is also true for Earth's gravity. We are pinned to the ground because space, so distorted by the Earth's mass, pushes us down from above. However, the slump in the fabric around Earth is not uniform, and Earth's gravity grows more intense as we move towards its center, where the curvature is at a maximum. Therefore, like the marble on the trampoline, an object that falls towards the Earth accelerates as it races towards the center of the planet. It falls faster when just above the surface than it does, say, when it is slightly above the atmosphere. But hey, according to special relativity, the faster you move through space, the slower you move through time. This means that time runs slower on Earth's surface than it does above the atmosphere. Now. Because different planets have different masses, and thus different gravitational strengths, they also accelerate objects at different rates. As we have learned, this means a variable passage of time. This is what happens in the movie Interstellar, when the protagonists land on a planet in the proximity of a black hole. The gravity on the planet is so severe that one hour on the surface is equivalent to seven years on Earth. Link in the comment section below if you want to watch the whole video. Hold that thought. Big object equals bigger gravity, bigger gravity slows down time. That's the first point I'm making. And this is not just in theory, it has been proven and already in practice. Our global positioning systems, GPS for example, takes into account Einstein's theory of relativity. I've included a link in the comment section below in case you're interested uh, to understand how a GPS functions. It's just that we haven't come across a mass that is extremely huge to significantly slow down time. Now, let's take a look at how big our observable universe is. The furthest object that our telescope was able to capture is 47 billion light years away. What is light year? Light year is an astronomical distance that light travels through in one year, which is equivalent to 9.46 trillion kilometers. <laughs> because you know, everything is like far, far away in the outer space, just we need a parameter that could capture the distance without having to put many, many zeros in it. So that means the actual observable universe is. 47 billion times 9.46 trillion kilometers across. Allah mentions in the Quran there are seven heavens or layers of skies and that he adorned the first layer with lanterns or stars. This means the observable universe is only the first layer of the sky and what we can observe 
is not even all of it because we haven't created a telescope powerful enough to observe the entirety of the first layer of skies. And we know that the universe is expanding at a rate faster than the speed of light and it gets better. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu described it. It is like a vast desert compared to a small ring. The small ring are the seven heavens, which includes everything that is in existence, including all the black holes and all the massive stars and galaxies, all the universes. Each time a universe compared to the next is like a small ring in the midst of a vast desert. And then there is also the kursi of Allah, the chair of Allah. And the desert is the arsh of Allah, the throne of Allah. So imagine the size of the throne, the mass of the throne, the gravity of the throne, the way it must curve the space and time around it, the way it bends the very fabric of space. So how slow is time going at the throne? Let that sink in for a bit. A God who is at that level with time almost stagnant and oversees this colossal universe don't you think he would have knowledge of everything from where he is? And a God who never tires from administering this universe, just imagine how powerful that God is. Listen to the snippet of Ustad Tim Humble's lecture on Allah's knowledge. Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. Allah doesn't just know everything as in a general sense, knows everything about everything but in an absolutely specific sense, in the most minute detail, Allah knows everything. Nothing is never outside of Allah's knowledge. Allah's knowledge doesn't have a beginning and Allah's knowledge doesn't have an end. Nobody can encompass the smallest amount of Allah's knowledge without His permission. His knowledge encompasses what exists and what doesn't exist. Meaning that Allah knows everything about everything that exists in this world. But not just that. Allah knows everything about everything that doesn't exist. So for example, let us take something that doesn't exist. A mythical creature. For example, I don't know, the phoenix or something. You know, like something completely mythical. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything about that thing that doesn't exist. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything about that which does exist. There is nothing which exists or doesn't exist except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about it. Allah knows what is possible and Allah knows what is impossible. What's the evidence that Allah knows what is impossible? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to us in the Quran about what would happen if there was more than one God besides Allah. Is this possible or impossible? Mm. Impossible that there can be more than one God besides Allah. But Allah still knows what would happen if there was a God besides Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if there was more than one God, each one would have taken what taken away what they had created and and they would have fought one another and rebelled against one another. This is impossible. But Allah knows what would happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about having taken a son and about what would have, what uh, about the, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is is high above taking a son. And so in essence Allah knows what would have happened if Allah had taken a son. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from that. So Allah knows the possible and the impossible. Allah knows what has happened in the past. Everything that has happened in the past. Whether people were there or not there. You know you, know, you hear the philosophers argue about a tree that falls in the forest and nobody is there to hear it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears everything and sees everything. And this is our quickest reply to them. When they talk about what happens about a tree in the forest that is cut down and there's nobody there to hear it and nobody there to see it and, and so on and so forth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears it. Allah knows everything that has happened. And Allah knows everything that will happen. So Allah knows all the choices you're going to make in your life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what will happen tomorrow. Allah knows what will happen after tomorrow. Allah knows what will happen before the day of judgment. Allah knows what will happen on the day that you die and the day before you die and the day before that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything that will happen. And Allah knows what something would be like if it did happen. So if something happened, Allah knows what would happen. And if that thing didn't happen, Allah also knows what would happen. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that if you chose to disbelieve, what would happen to you? And if you chose to believe, Allah knows what would happen to you. Now, you can only choose one or the other. You can only choose to believe or disbelieve. You can't be from the people of paradise and the people of hellfire. But Allah knows what would happen if you were from the people of the hellfire, and Allah knows what would happen if you were from the people of Jannah. In other words, there is no way to escape the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَحَاطَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عِلْمًا Allah has encompassed everything with His knowledge. So there is no way for you to escape the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nothing that can happen or will happen or won't happen or should happen or has happened or might have happened except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about it. Guys, we've only examined one technical aspect of one verse of the Quran. I haven't even gotten down to the mind-blowing, nitty-gritty grammatical aspects, linguistic beauty, the content itself, detailed scientific facts, prophecies that came true of the Quran. When all these aspects come together, it is so jaw-dropping that this book could not have been written by a man. It has to be the words of Allah. Now, if a believing Muslim such as our Palestinian brothers and sisters believe this, can you see how strong of a conviction that is? They put all their trust in this mighty, powerful God that owns the universe. The God that owns the universe, don't you think there is anything that he can't do? Putting your trust in something that huge makes you fearless of this relatively tiny dunya and of everything in it. The detailed scientific facts and the 